Chapter 5. The Anaconda Squeezes Even though Grant had saved the army at Shiloh and driven the Confederates from the field, it seemed now that practically everyone was mad at him, including the general public, which had so recently proclaimed him a great Union hero after the Fort Donelson victory. News reports of the fighting published in northern papers, alongside the horrendous casualty list, began to accuse Grant of allowing his army to have been completely surprised by the rebel attack that men in blue had been bayoneted to death while sleeping in their tents, that Grant had so little control of his troops that most of them ran off at the first signs of battle, that Grant had been dallying in a mansion far away when he should have been with his army, seeing, it, seeing to it that his men were protected and alert against a surprise attack, that he had been saved only by the miraculous arrival of Buell at the last moment, that he was negligent in pers not pursuing and destroying an enemy army after it was clearly in retreat. Worse, soon came the usual charges of drunkenness, incompetence, and sloth. References were made to his unmilitary bearing of carelessness and indifference to his soldiers. Ohio even sent down its lieutenant governor, who reported back to Cincinnati commercial appeal that there existed in Grant's army an intense feeling of indignation against General Grant and Prentice, and the general feeling amongst the most intelligent men with whom I conversed was that they ought to be court-martialed and shot. Grant was denounced from the halls of Congress to the White House as a hopeless and inept blunderer and alcoholic, and a chorus arose for his removal. The buck, as always, stopped with Lincoln. Popular lore has it that he had told the critics, find out what kind of whiskey Grant drinks and send a barrel of it to my other generals. There is no direct evidence that he actually said this, but there is evidence that he responded, I can't spare this man. He fights. The fairer, however, nearly unhinged Sherman. In a volcanic letter to the Ohio Lieutenant Governor, Benjamin Stanton, Sherman stopped just short of challenging him to a duel. In a point-by-point -point refutation, Sherman accused Stanton of preferring camp stories to authentic data than within your reach, and circulating li libels and falsehoods, and concluded that Stanton had deliberately sought to undermine the mor morale of the entire United States Army. Sherman reserved his most pungent scorn, However, for the reporters and the editors, whom, he claimed in a letter to his wife, are the chief cause of this unhappy war, they fan the flames of local hatred and keep alive those prejudices which have forced friends into opposing hostile ranks. In the North, the people have been made to believe that those of the South are horrid barbarians, unworthy of Christian burials, whilst at the South, the people, who, the people have been made to believe that we wanted to steal their Negroes, rob them of their property, pollute their family, an allusion to a misgeneration, and to reduce the whites below the level of their own Negroes. If the newspapers are to be our government, he wrote, I would prefer Bragg, Beauregard, or any other high Confederate officer instead. The American press, he complained to his brother Senator John Sherman, is a shame and a reproach to a civilized people. When a man is too lazy to work and too cowardly to steal, he turns editor and manufactures public opinion. Without mentioning McClernand by name, Sherman reserved a special loathing for those reporters who he believed attached themselves for pay to particular high-ranking officers in return for giving them favorable mention in news stories. Of these, Sherman wrote, My rule is now well understood, and they keep clear to me. If one comes into my camp, I will arrest them as a spy and have them tried by court-martial and, if possible, shot or hung. In the midst of this uproar, Halleck arrived to personally assume command of the army or, more precisely, three armies, Grant's, Buell's, and another belonging to the newly promoted Major General, John Pope, presently expected to arrive at Shiloh. This would give Halleck a total of 120,000 men, with 200 guns divided into four corps, commanded by Buell, Pope, McClernand, and Major General George H. Thomas, a 45-year-old Virginian and West Point graduate who had sided with the Union and whom his men called Pap. Grant, however, received nothing for his troubles during the Battle of Shiloh, except perhaps the motion, at least he viewed it that way, to become Halleck's second in command, a position that, considering Halleck's egomaniacal personality, amounted to little more than a sinecure. Grant rarely complained, but Sherman could see that his old friend plainly felt the indignity, if not an insult, heaped upon him. When Grant finally did protest, Halleck slapped him down, saying, for the last three months, I have done everything in my power to ward off the attacks, 
which were made upon you. If you believe me, your friend, you will not require explanations, if not, explanations on my part, will be the, of little avail. This was mostly a, gratu a gratuitous falsehood, but in Halleck's favor, Sherman did, did recall that when Lincoln had demanded a reason for the shocking casualty rate at Shiloh, Halleck at least did not lay the blame on Grant, but instead placed it on the Confederate generals and their soldiers. Meantime, on Friday, April 4th, the same stormy night that Union and Confederate soldiers had experienced the day before Shiloh, some 150 miles to the northwest, one of Commodore Foote's federal ironclads, the Carondelet, pushed off quietly from its berth three miles above a low-lying island smack in the middle of the Mississippi River. This was island number 10, so marked on navigation charts because it was the 10th such river island in a chain beginning at the mouth of the Ohio. When the Confederates evacuated Columbus, Kentucky, after the fall of Fort Donelson, they planned to make a stand at Island Number 10, which was fast becoming the South's last, best hope to control the Mississippi from southern Kentucky, all the way down to Vicksburg, a 300-mile-long stretch that in included the critically important city of Memphis. On February 28th, two weeks after the surrender of Fort Donelson, a small army under Brigadier General John Pope, a 40-year-old West Pointer, with strong connections to the Republican Party, as well as to the Lincoln family, began a march southward from Commerce, Missouri, to New Madrid, Missouri, taking 10 days to cover the approximately 70 miles. New Madrid was across from and a couple of miles north of Island Number 10, where the river curves in a reverse S-bend, like a sidewinder rattlesnake in motion. When he got there, Pope received a much ruder at reception than he'd reckoned on. Upon the evacuation of Columbus, there had been 17,000 Confederate troops on hand, as well as 60 pieces of artillery, many of them of large caliber. But during Johnson's withdrawal from Kentucky a few weeks earlier, Rear Guard, in temporary command, began stripping the Western Department of any troops he could find to meet the impending crisis that was building up with the Yankee army now before Corinth. Therefore, he had ordered the fighting bishop, Polk, to bring 10,000 Confederate soldiers from Columbus to the Corinth fortifications and send only 7,000 down to defend New Major and Island Number 10, taking with them all the big guns. Thus, Pope had figured out figured that taking Island Number 10 was going to be a cinch. Leaving the island so poorly defended was a damned if you do, damned if you don't choice for the Confederates. The Bureau Guard reasoned that if his army could defeat the Yankees at Corinth, and the forces he had left at Island Number 10 could merely hold on, then the rebel armies would sweep northward and drive the Yankees more than all before them to the Ohio River and beyond. It was in this setting that Pope encountered the Confederates in early March, snug in their fortifications at New Major. What he saw he did not like. First, the Mississippi was in its springtime flood, which had inundated much of the countryside. Second, the enemy lines were surrounded by marshes and protected in the rear by the river. Third, his intelligence had not been able to discover the strength of the rebel garrison, which, in fact, totaled 1,400 men and 14 guns. Fourth, a small flotilla of wooden Confederate gunboats had arrived to support the defense. The first thing Pope did was order a reconnaissance in a force, which amounted to an attack by 7,000 troops. This was almost immediately called off when the blue-clad soldiers came under a withering fire from both the new major guns and those of the little rebel gunboats, which, because of the high condition of the river, could blast the countryside for more than a mile in any direction. Now Pope did what he thought was the prudent thing and settled in for a siege. He ordered large caliber siege guns, which soon arrived from St. Louis. As well, Halleck began sending him more men until toward the end his army had grown to about 30,000. He captured the little hamlet of Point Pleasant, downriver from New Major, from which his artillery could drive off any Confederate attempt to supply island number 10 by water. Finally, he asked for and received the aid of Commodore Foote's fleet of seven large ironclads, towing ten odd-looking mortar boats, which could each lob a 13-inch projectile more than a mile. Having watched this formidable build-up, the Confederate commanders agreed that New Major was untenable, and under cover of a horrendous rainstorm, they evacuated their soldiers to Island Number 10 on the night of March 13th. Two days later, the siege began in earnest, when Foote anchored the mortar boats 60 feet long by 20 feet wide, 
just out of range of the rebel guns and began a round-the-clock bombardment of Island Number 10. This noisy business continued for two weeks, without observable effect, while Pope became vexed nearly to distraction by the lack of cooperation from Foote's big ironclads, which lay at anchor out of danger of doing nothing. Pope had devised a scheme for the undoing of Island Number 10 by sending a large body of his men across the river below the island near Point Pleasant. Once on the Tennessee side, they would be able to completely cut off supply lines to the besieged enemy outpost. Trouble was, at least one of the ironclads needed to get below the island to blow the little Confederate flotilla out of the water so that Pope's troops could cross unimpeded. Then it would be just a matter of time. Yet, a foot would not hear of it, and the Navy, then is now, loss of a ship, especially something so large as an ironclad, was a very serious matter, one that would be examined by boards and even court martialed so that blame could be laid. In the Navy, careers were made or broken by such choices, and Foote wasn't ready to stick his neck out. After examining the situation, he concluded that trying to pass the large Confederate batteries this that bristled along island number 10 and the Kentucky and Tennessee shore would subject his ships to almost certain destruction. Almost as bad was the prospect that one or more of his ironclads would be disabled by enemy fire and, unlike operations at Fort Henry and Donaldson, where the rivers ran northward, the boat and its crew would be swept helplessly southward by the flood current right into the waiting arms of the rebels. Possibly the Commodore's decision was also clouded by its physical condition. The wounded foot he had received during the Battle of Fort Donaldson had not healed and showed no signs of doing so, and he could scarcely move from his berth aboard the flagship. The army, therefore, loitered in an in inert frustration, punctuated only by a continuous booming from the mortar boats, until Pope finally asked Halleck to solve the problem, which he did, by asking Foot if there was not some way to find willing volunteers to run the gauntlet below. Foot called a war council of his captains and, of the seven, all said the task was impossible, but one. He was Commander Henry Walk, the man who had led the Navy flotilla during Grant's attack at Belmont, and Foot told him to get ready. The preparations took four days. First, Foote put 50 volunteers from the Illinois Regiment into boats that, with muffled oars, sneaked up to a Confederate battery of 11 big guns on the Kentucky side of the river and discovered to their relief that high water had led to the position being manned only for fire missions. The Yankee infantrymen gleefully spiked what guns they could and heaved others from their mounts, rendering the battery unserviceable for the time being. Then, the next day, April 1st, Every mortar boat in the fleet concentrated fire on a large rebel floating battery anchored at the north or northern tip of the island number 10. The fire was so intense that the defenders cut the moorings and let the battery drift downstream, where it became harmless. Walk had been busy preparing a ship, Carondelet, for the dangerous passage. He heaped every piece of iron he could scrounge onto the port side top decks, including a huge length of anchor chain that he wound around the pilot house. His engineers rerouted the steam that normally escaped from the smoke smokestacks back to the paddle wheel housing to avoid the puff-puff noise of the ship. Toward dusk, on the day of the effort, he took on a company of riflemen to protect against a boarding attempt and, as well, the entire crew was armed with cutlasses, pistols, pikes, and hot steam hoses connected to the boilers. At 8 p.m., under cover of a fortitious thunderstorm, walked steam down the river stopping after about a mile to pick up a coal barge packed with bales of hay that he lashed on to protect the vulnerable side of the vessel. Carondelet came quietly and steadily through the murky night, obscured by the storm from moonshine, but frequently lit up by flashes of lightning. On her bows was an experienced river pilot, taking surroundings and relaying them back to the pilot house. All was going just according to plan, and it was even hoped by some aboard that the ironclad might slip by the Confederate battery's sight unseen when the unexpected happened, as it often does. In rerouting the exhaust line from the smokestacks, the soot from the boiler fires that were normally dampened by the escaping steam suddenly caught fire, shooting up a continuous blaze of flames five feet high from both stacks. This peculiar phenomenon caught the rebels' attention, and immediately illumination rockets began bursting above the river. At this, Walk ordered full steam ahead, and Carondelet shot it forward. According to an observer, 
Vivid flashes of lightning lit up the hurried preparations of the, of the rebels, who were scurrying toward their guns, while peal after peal of thunder reverberated along the river, and the rain poured down in torrents. Now all the Confederate batteries within range were firing, causing the shoreline to burst into an orange sheet of flame. From its place in the bows, the river pilot stood in a perfect shower of cannonballs and musket balls. As he tried to discern the course by dropping light, by dropping lead lines or make out banks of sh or shoals in the lightning flashes. For all their efforts, the rebels' long, difficult fortifying of Island Number 10 had come to a knot. A reporter from the St. Louis Dispatch recorded that the judgment which we were able to form from the shrieking of their shot was that they flew from 5 yards to 30 yards over our heads. This was because Walk had decided that rather than do the expected, which was to steer the boat way over to the Missouri side of the river, he would hug close in the, to the Kentucky Tennessee shore and to Island Number 10, where the Confederate batteries, being located on high bluffs, would have to depress their guns to get at him. Thus they overshot, and thus Pope had his ironclad down below, which made quick work of the Confederate wooden flotilla, chasing it downstream and out of the action. Now, according to plan, Pope ferried his army across the river, while the Confederates, acknowledging that their situation was hopeless, began evacuating Island Number 10 and its environs. Pope caught up with them a few miles south of the little town of Tiptonville. Just as Grant was fighting for his life at Shiloh, it backed what he claimed was the whole force of 7,000 rebels. Some historians discount this and place the actual figure a little more than half dead, the remainder having escaped through the swamps. But, in any case, Pope enhanced his reputation and earned a fine new promotion that dramatically revealed how overrated he was. When Island Number 10 fell, Pope was told to bring practically all his army to Pittsburgh Landing to join Halleck in the movement against Corinth, leaving Foote in the Navy with only a few regiments of infantry to deal with rebel defenses along the river, the immediate prize, of course, being Memphis. On April 13th, Foote's fleet had reached Fort Pillow, a rebel bastion named after the Confederate general who had disgraced himself at Fort Donelson, which was well fortified with long-range, heavy artillery. As a Island number 10, the ailing Commodore was content to stand off and bombard the position until some better plan for its reduction took shape in his mind, and this he did for more than a week, when momentous news reached him. After a tedious struggle that had begun six months earlier, the Union Navy had captured its greatest parts yet in the war, New Orleans. With a population of about 170,000, New Orleans was not only the Confederacy's largest city, it was larger than the rest of the South's major cities combined, and had been a major commercial hub for the southern states. By the eve of the Civil War, it accounted for nearly a third of the nation's exports, including some 2.2 million bales of cotton, as well as rice, timber, sugar, and other commodities and goods, finished or unfinished. But by late 1861, much of the trade had vanished, due to the drying up of commerce with the states of the Midwest and to the federal blockade patrolling the mouth of the Mississippi. Actually, the river had had several major mouths, and numerous smaller ones, as it drained through the ponderous Marsh Choke Delta into the Gulf of Mexico. While the Union Navy was able to close some of these outlets, it was never able to completely shut them off, and therein lay the Yankees' need to take and hold New Orleans, where all river traffic must pass before it reached the channels and swamps below. Conventional wisdom in Washington, however, held that taking New Orleans by sea, that is, by the deep draft Blue Water Navy, was not feasible, first because the fleet's largest warships would be unable to cross over the many shoals and bars at the Gulf Passes, and second, even if they could, two formidable obstacles lay in their way. These were Confederate forts St. Philip and Jackson, situated across from each other about 70 miles downriver, brandishing a total of 126 big guns between them, all commanding their approaches from downriver. Unfortunately for the Confederates and the hapless New Orleans, the authorities and Richmond for once concurred with Washington. As a stopgap measure deployed the hull, in the autumn of 1861, the Union Navy patrolling off the various river passes concluded that if they could get a squadron of large ships up the river about 15 miles to what was known as Head of Passes, it could cut down considerably on blockade running, since all large boats and ships would have to pass through there to reach the Gulf outlets. Accordingly, on October 3, 1861, 
four U.S. warships aided by information provided them by local oysters and fishermen, managed barely to scrape across the bar of Southwest Pass and station themselves in fairly deep water to await any enemy craft seeking to exit the river. They found few or none, but a week later, in the inky early morning hours of October 11th, this large and powerful federal flotilla received an unwelcome surprise. At 3.30 a.m., Captain John Honest John, Pope, no relation to General Pope of Island No. 10 fame, was awakened in his cabin aboard the flagship Richmond, a brand new 225-foot-long, 22-gun, 2,600-ton steam screw sloop, by a sailor crying, Captain, there's a steamer alongside of us. Pope rushed topside to find what he later described as an indescribable object, approaching a ship. It was turned out to be the Manassas, a Confederate ram hastily fashioned out of an old tugboat and covered with iron boil, boilerplate variously said to look like a sharp-pointed egg, an eggplant, a potato, or a turtleback. The rebel vessel shivered to Richmond's timbers with a mighty blow, but, as luck would have it, had not struck the ship proper, but instead a coal barge moored alongside. Panic, however, prevailed upon the Richmond, and Captain Pope signaled his other three ships. Enemy present, get underway. While his guns began firing broadsides into the blackness in all directions. The Confederate arrangement had been that once Manassas had struck and disabled Richmond, she would fire off a rocket that would launch the main attack. This consisted of towing three fire rafts toward the Yankee ships, which would be followed by five converted river towboats armed with various calibers of guns, and which would begin blasting away at the lit up targets. Unfortunately, the fire rafts drifted away, as did the Richmond and the Preble, which had dropped their anchor cables in their haste to get underway, and were now caught in the four-knot current without enough steam to steer, promptly running fast aground on a sandbar. The other two Federal ships, Vincennes and Waterwitch, managed to flee over the bar and into the Gulf as the Union Navy debated whether or not to scuttle the remaining vessels, while the ragtag rebel flotilla smugly retired marking the end of that phase of the Union effort to blockade the Mississippi. Not long after this disgraceful episode, an ambitious Yankee Navy commander named David Dixon Porter thought he had arrived at a way to get big ships into the river and pass the formidable defenses of Fort Jackson and St. Philip, and up to New Orleans itself. His plan was this. It was already proven, or so he thought, that if the tides were right deep draft, naval warships could be gotten over the sandbars and shoals of the southwest pass. Once into the river, if a fleet of mortar boats could be constructed, they could move up within range of the two rebel rations, theoretically by bombarding around the clock from a range of a mile or so. Each day, the mortar boats could lob upwards of 3,000 explosive shells, weighing 250 pounds apiece, into the rebel forts, blasting them into oblivion within 48 hours while the rest of the fleet waited out of danger. Then, Porter informed the Secretary of the Navy, New Orleans would be theirs for the taking. It all sounded good to Gideon Wells, because capturing New Orleans would be by far the most important action so far in the war, and he immediately ordered work to begin on 21 of the, more, more, 21 of the mortar craft. The question then became, who would lead such an expedition, since it was obvious that Porter, as a mere commander, did not have the rank. Porter had the solution to that, too. He offered up his foster brother, Captain David Glasgow Farragut, a 60-year-old salt who had served in the War of 1812 and who was presently languishing on a Navy retirement board at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Stunned and delighted to be snatched out of mothballs, Farragut energetically began to assemble his fleet, which was formidable. Two steam frigates, the largest in the Navy, five steam screw sloops, a dozen gunboats, plus the 21 mortar boats, as well as various tenders, towers, and barges, 243 guns in all. In fact, the largest American war fleet ever assembled. In addition, four operations against New Orleans proper, Farragut would have some 18,000 infantrymen under General Benjamin Butler of Boston, another of the political generals, who had raised his own army in New England and was now impatiently waiting for orders on Ship Island, an isolated sand dune in the Mississippi Sound, 25 miles south of Biloxi. There were delays and fallops, to be sure. Critical supplies and munitions were missing. There were rebel snipers to contend with, 
and the crucial element of surprise was lost when it was discovered that shifting sands had reduced the depth from 20 to 16 feet, and the bigger ships had to be scraped inch by inch across the bar, losing two weeks of time. As if all this wasn't bad enough, unbeknownst to Farragut, he was stabbed in the back by, of all people, his foster brother, David Dixon Porter, who had recommended him to lead the expedition in the first place. When Porter first concocted the plan to seize New Orleans and took it to the Navy Department, he knew that he would not be appointed to lead it himself. His actions thereafter suggest an almost diabolical scheme to set Farragut up as a straw man by first recommending him to lead the assault, then knocking him down with surreptitious communic communications to his bosses in order to obtain command for himself. Accordingly, just as the New Orleans operation was getting started, Porter wrote the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, disparaging Farragut's abilities, concluding that men of his age in a seafaring life are not fit for important enterprises. They lack the vigor of the youth. He, Farragut, talks very much at random at times and rather underrates the difficulties before him without fairly comprehending them. Whatever impression this ugly letter had, by April 14, 1862, Five months after Porter had laid out his original pen, Farragut, the knife still sticking from his back, was coming up the Mississippi, ready or not. Both the citizens of New Orleans and the Confederate authorities were greeted at these developments without, with mounting alarm. Things had seemed relatively secure only six months earlier when the Little River Defense Fleet repulsed the big Yankee warships ahead of the passes, so much so that in Richmond it was perceived that the real danger to the city would come from above, from those Union ironclads that had been constructed along the Ohio River. River. In desperation, the Confederacy had begun building four ironclads of its own, two at New Orleans and two at Memphis, each designed to be more powerful than those of the Federals. But then came Shiloh, draining away most of the manpower that had been assembled to protect New Orleans. Not only that, but as the Yankee war machine ground down the river toward New Madrid, in Island Number 10, most of the hastily assembled river defense fleet was sent north to operate against it. Now that the Federals were sent into the Mississippi in force, authorities in New Orleans urgently wanted their small flotilla back. But in a perfect example of the squeaky wheel getting greased, the Confederate Secretary of the Navy refused. The boats that had been built in New Orleans to defend New Orleans, he decreed, needed to stay above Memphis. For the enemy was already there and Force Jackson and St. Philip would simply have to hold their own against the Union Armada. Ever since the war opened, New Orleanians had been told that the forts were unpregnable, that their big guns were more than a match for any wooden warships the Union could throw at them, that land defense batteries up and down the river would blast the enemy to splinters, that a rebel army was on hand to reply any Yankees who ventured ashore. But now that the hour was at hand, things were looking much chancier. The new commander of Confederate forces at New Orleans wasn't so confident either. He was Major General Mansfield Lavelle, a 39-year-old West Point quasi-Yankee from the District of Columbia, whose prior occupation had been Deputy Street Commissioner of New York City, and who, with everyone else, had recently turned out for the funeral cortege of Albert Sidney Johnson as it wound up through the streets of New Orleans toward a marble crypt. Lavelle had been dealt a cruel hand for a newly arrived commander, because Grant's army, now Halleck's, was inching towards Corinth, and there would be no bringing back of the thousands of soldiers from New Orleans who had been sent northward against the Federals at Shiloh. Laying that aside, Lavelle set about strengthening Fort Jackson and St. Philip, improving their overhead cas casements against plunging bombardment, positioning shore or water batteries, stocking rations and ammunition, installing more than 100 pieces of artillery, and beefing up their com complements to more than a thousand to serve the guns. After consulting with his commanders, Lavelle ordered what everyone hoped would be the saving feature of the fortifications. A raft or boom across the river, held up by large floating cypress logs, that would cause the Federal ships to stop or at least slow them down so that the rebel guns could blow into it, them into the eternity. Only now did the Confederate authorities seemed to come to grips with the age of steam-powered warships, when, in fact, steam power had been prevalent for several decades. Fort St. Philip had been around since the days of the French, but after the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812, 
Andrew Jackson recommended rebuilding it, as well as another bastion, Fort Jackson, on the west bank opposite. Designed on Valbin's Pentagon model, by the time they were completed during the 1820s, the fort presented formidable obstacles indeed, for in those days an enemy would have come in slow sailing ships, subject to fickle winds and currents, that provided gunners an excellent opportunity to sink them. But in the age of the modern steam engine, all had changed. Now warships could ascend the river at will, against winds and currents, presenting hard-to-hit moving targets, especially at night. Thus, a boom across the river seemed the only answer, and work on a heavy gun in March, but a spate of spring storms sent the river rushing down higher than ever, and with more than the usual contentment that it had. Large trees uprooted by erosion for hundreds of miles along the river bank above that hung up in the boom until it broke. Another boom was hastily built, this one held up by the hulks of old sailing vessels. In addition, a number of fire rafts were constructed, set to be released upon the Union fleet when it approached to the forts. Moreover, one of the two big ironclads in the works at New Orleans was ready to be sent downriver in a case of emergency, even though its engines did not work. That being done, the Confederates and the citizens of New Orleans anxiously awaited what would happen next. They did not have to let, they did not have long to wait. By April 15th, the beginning of Holy Week, the first of Farragut's ships began arriving at a point just south of the forts and two days later, its mortar boats were, were anchored along the west bank of behind a large stand of forest that the Confederates ne negligently had forgotten to cut down. Two days later, Farragut opened the bombardment at a range of about a half a mile from Fort Jackson and somewhat longer for St. Philip. It took a while for the mortar boats to function as designed because the crews were new and untried, and the same was true of the Confederate gunners. But by the next day, Good Friday, both sides had improved and a perfect duel began, with hundreds and then thousands of the massive projectiles striking the forts, dislodging guns, threatening to send powder magazines of fire, and killing and wounding a few men. For the most part, the Confederates simply huddled beneath their heavy overhead casements to ride out the storm and fired their guns from beneath their shelters. A few mortar boats were hit, but little damage was done. Also, on a day that the bombardment began, rebel soldiers were reconnaissance, were observed making repairs on the boom, and after setting up a night reconnaissance party for a first-hand look, Farragut devised a plan to break it. On the night of April 19th, during a tremendous thunderstorm and furious shelling by the mortars, two of the smaller Union gunboats sneaked up to the cable. An engineer from one of them attached an explosive charge connected by two electrical wires. The idea was that the boat would then be allowed to drift downstream, and when a safe distance was reached, the wires would be struck together to produce the explosion. Unfortunately, an ill wind blew the boat away too fast and the wires broke. Another party from the second gunboat approached the problem in a more conventional manner. Yankee sailors got aboard one of the hulks and went at the cable with hammers and chisels, and within half an hour the boom parted. The Confederates caught on to this, and only after the damage had been done, and despite heavy firing, the Federal gunboats got away. For the next two days, the bombarding went on, but to Farragut's supreme displeasure, no appreciable damage was done to the forts, which continued to return fire obstinately and in kind. Finally, he could stand it no longer, and despite Porter's protest to the contrary, on Easter Sunday, Farragut declared that all the mortaring had not produced the desired effect, and that his fleet would run the gauntlet before the enemy could repair the boom. Because of unfavorable downriver winds that would have slowed the ships, Farragut waited until the early morning hours of the 24th to launch his assault. Then, at 2 a.m., his fleet shipped anchoring. <laughs> Sorry. Then, at 2 a.m., his fleet shipped anchor and headed upriver into they knew not quite what. But when Farragut's clerk, a man named Osborne, optimistically predicted that they would lose not more than a hundred men, the expedition commander responded darkly, I wish I could think so. At first, everything went even better than according to plan. Farragut had arranged his 17-ship fleet into three divisions, intended to be spaced about a quarter mile apart. The testy old captain had planned to leave the first division himself, until his staff talked him out of it on the grounds that if he were killed, or wounded, the movement might fall into a disarray, and so he led the 2nd Division in his flagship Hartford.
Preparations had begun several days earlier. The big ships were smeared with mud as camouflage, and their decks painted white to reflect whatever starlight from there was for easier navigation. Powder shells and shot were piled by each gun, and the grisly practice of sprinkling the decks with sand to keep the gun crews from slipping in blood was completed. The 2 a.m. cast-off of the 1st Division was not flawless. The 22-gun Penascola could not free up her anchor and delayed the start by an hour while the other ships milled around in the stream. The assembly, however, went totally undetected by the Confederates, who at the least should have had lookouts posted close to the shores to give warning, and the entire 1st Division passed along through the open part of the boom before being spotted. Even then, the alarm was sounded not only by the rebel lookouts, but by the Federals themselves, when Porter had either every one of his 20 mortars boats up upon Fort Jackson, as well as blast away at the Confederate water batteries that were located below the fort. A major aspect of the rebel defense plan had been to unleash a torrent of burning fire rafts that were expected not only to illuminate the Federal ships, but, it was hoped, to set at least some of them on fire. But for some reason this did not materialize as planned, and only a few of the rafts went downstream. However, the Confederates did manage to set off huge bonfires of cordwood and driftwood laid, among, laid along the banks, which provided some lighting for their gunners, whose artillery was trained on the area around the boom. By 345, the six ships of the 1st Division not only had reached the cut in the boom, but were through it when this storm of shot and shell smashed into them, splintering mast, spars, and superstructure, dismounting guns, crushing topside timbers, and killing and wounding sailors. By then, the rebels scraped up mosquito fleet, went into the action, including the egg-shaped ram Manassas. It consisted of eight aging river steamers and tugs that had been jury rigged with pieces of iron to give some slight protection. Some carried bow rams and a few medium-heavy guns. They weren't much to stand up to Farragut's ships, but apparently the thinking was they might serve to slow them down enough for the big guns from the forts to do real damage. In any case, when the alarm first sounded, the Confederate fleet sailed out to meet the enemy in one of the most desperate and unequal naval battles of the Civil War. The experience of the Confederate gunboat Governor Moore provides an example. The Moor, named after the governor of Louisiana, had already tangled with three of Farragut's big ships, and most of the 93 men crew had been killed or wounded, including half of those on deck serving the guns. However, the commander, a former U.S. Navy officer named Beverly Cannon, was determined to fight on. He had only two guns, both 32-pounder rifles, one astern and one on the bow. But with these, he launched an attack on the Federal 22-gun Varuna, manning the bow gun himself. His first shot riddled Varuna's decks, killing and wounding a dozen men, and then, with his own gun, knocked off its mounts. Cannon backed out, took a broadside from Varuna, that swept his decks of nearly every living object, and plowed into Varuna's steamboard, starboard side, crushing her planking and ribs. Varuna then fired another round of shot at point blank range into Governor Moore and the 74th's crew now either killed or wounded. The plucky rebe rebel skipper headed toward shore to abandon ship. Varuna, meantime, staggered away downstream where they ignominiously sank in mud. I ordered the wounded to be placed in a boat, Kennan said, and all men who could to save themselves by swimming to the shore and hiding themselves in the marshes. I remained to set the ship on fire, the keeper from falling into the hands of the enemy. Then he scrambled on deck to save himself, but found wounded with no one left to take care of him. I remained and lowered a boat and got through just in time to be made prisoner. The wounded were afterwards attended to by the surgeons of the Oneida and Eureka. Lit up by the illumination fires on the riverbanks and the lightning-like flashes of artillery shell explosions, ferocious little battles like these raged up and down the river for the better part of an hour and a half in the area of the forts. A few of the fire rafts got into action, flaming mast high and pushed by the tugs. One of these, the CSS Marshaw, Hartford, Mosher, saw Hartford and entered the gap in the boom and began nudging its flames fire toward Farragut's flagship. Hartford's homesmen tried to evade the fire, 
Bernard Process promptly ran his ship aground, with her bow spit stuck out over the Louisiana marshes. Marshall shoved the raft against Hartford's side, prompting Farragut to cry out, My, is it going to end this way? Flames were scorching Hartford's decks and looking up toward her mast as her gunner's port shot and shell into Mosher, and Fairy Guts Clerk began dropping 20 pound artillery shells down into the burning raft. When they exploded, they blew out the fire, but the big warship was badly burned and a number of sailors singed. Still, Hartford was able to back out of the mud and rejoin the fight, which continued unabated until around sunrise amid great clouds of gun smoke and the booming of more than 500 big guns that produced a continuous flashing and racketing that reminded one sailor of a vision of hell. While to the crusty old admirer himself, it was as if the artillery of heaven was playing on earth. Most of the Confederate boats were sunk, crippled, abandoned, or run aground. The Manassas was left, a flaming hawk that floated downriver past the anchored mortar fleet. The little McRae, however, refused to give up. According to the commander of the Rebel River Rhine forces, Colonel Edward Higgins, who watched her continue the battle alone. At daylight, Higgins said, I observed the McRae gallantly fighting at terrible odds, contending at close quarters with two of the enemy's powerful ships. Her gallant commander, Lieutenant Thomas Huger, fell during the conf conflict, severely, but I trust not mortally, wounded. A little after that, it was all over. Smoke that had lain over the river like a deep Louisiana fog was soon peeled away on the fresh spring breeze, revealing that most of the Farragut's fleet was now above the fort and the big danger had passed, missing were Veruna, which had been sunk down river. Itasca, disabled by a shot in her boiler, failed to make it through the boom, and Kennebec, which got tangled up in it and couldn't move, Winona, lost an eye, I tried to get by just after daylight, but was turned back when fierce fire from the fort threatened to sink her. Several theories of naval warfare have been dispelled that morning, most notably Porter's notion that a heavy bombardment by large mortars would reduce any fortification to ruins in a matter of days. The forts were indeed heavily wrecked, but the damage to Farragut's fleet was testimony enough that they could continue to function, especially during daylight, when the Winona quickly found the going too hot to handle. Another maxim that called for rethinking on both sides was the concept that wooden ships can never force passage between heavily reinforced modern land batteries. Searching for a reason, Jefferson Davis proclaimed that it was only because Farragut had made his move at night instead of the in daytime. Reinforcing his opinion with a statement from the Confederate commander on the scene, who declared that except for the cover afforded by the obscurity of darkness, I shall always remain satisfied that the enemy would never have succeeded in passing Fort Jackson and St. Philip. This was true as far as it went, but raises a cardinal rule of military warfare, which is always expect the unexpected. While the Confederates allowed the broken boom to go unrepaired remains a mystery. Large as the gap was, any cursory inspection would have revealed the cut. With the powerful enemy fleet just below, it would seem to be negligent. Negligent. Negligence of the highest order, yet no one was ever charged. Likewise, the use of underwater torpedoes, what are now called mines, was well established by them, and it would seem that just it would seem that such obstacles would have been of immeasurable value in conjunction with the, in the boom. None were laid, however, possibly owing to the fast rushing current at the point, and the constant influx of debris and dryheads that flooded the river. Who can tell the result that the rebels had placed a number of these destructive devices right within the gap the Federal Navy had cut in the boom? Farragut had and his fleet reassembled that morning at a point six miles above the fort called Quarantine Station. There he took stock and began clean up and repairs. Thirty-seven sailors lay dead and 147 were being tended by the surgeons. While this was going on, crews washed the mud camouflage from the top sides decks. From the top sides. Decks were cleared of debris and swept clean, and shell holes were hastily covered in a fleet made as ship shape as impossible for the next item on the agenda, which was New Orleans itself. The infantry force of 10,000 under Butler had followed in shallow draft transports through the bayous and would march into New Orleans within the week. But Farragut's fleet 
within it with his powerful runes, had reached the city front. After daybreak on April 25th, the sounds of heavy cannonading wafted up toward the end, wafted up toward the city from Shalmet, where Farragut's ships, ships were easily knocking out the last rebel shore batteries. By mid-morning, angry cries and curses rang out from atop the great city levee, as the tall coast, as the tall mast of the Yankee fleet were seen coming up river. Early editions of the newspapers had carried headlines touting glorious news from the forts before the awful truth was learned. The days was gloomy, overcast with rain, and the mood of the people matched the weather. As soon as the news of the Yankee passing the forts reached New Orleans, the citizens burst into a frantic uproar. The city had known this kind of anxiety five decades earlier when it came under attack by a large British army and naval force during the War of 1812. In the final superb action of that conflict, a determined defense by a ragamuffin force of Louisianians and backwoodsmen from Tennessee and Kentucky led by Andrew Jackson had destroyed a 10,000-man British professional army on the plains of Shaman, and the great British war fleet had been turned back by the guns of Fort St. Philip. At the time, it was the stuff of which legends are made. But that was then, and this was half a century later. Now, as Farragut's ships were began rounding Slaughterhouse Bend, the sight of their black silhouettes sent a shudder of fright and indig indignation through the Bellegarde and defenseless city. Women wept and men shook their fists and brandished pistols and shotguns. The levee was choked with agitated mobs burning cotton by the hundreds of bales and dumping into the Mississippi barrels of rice, sugar, molasses, and everything else in the warehouses along the wharfs that might be of use to the Yankees, including, and what must have been painful for some to watch, casks of whiskey, wine, and rum. There was little else they should do. They had sent their soldiers away to whip the Yankees at Shiloh, only to have them defeated. They had counted on the forts to make them safe, but these two had failed. The river defense fleet had been set constructed for their protection and had been set up to Memphis. Their last hope had been the powerful ironclads Louisiana and Mississippi, but almost at this very moment, Louisiana was floating down the river 70 miles to the south, a burning hawk scudded by her own crew, and now to their own and now to their astonishment and dismay came the Mississippi before their very eyes, cast adrift in flames to save her from capture. Nothing was left save wrath and despair as the crowds on the levee howled and screamed with rage. The rebel commander Lovell had clearly seen the end once Farragut got, had gotten past the forts, and he evacuated his few remaining troops so that the civilian authorities could declare New Orleans an open city. This, it was to be hoped, would deprive the Yankees of any moral excuse to bombard the town into a pile of bricks and rubble. Farragut's ships were lying right off the crowded levee when the, menaced, when the admirer would demand to surrender. When he got instead was defiance. Two of his officers, bold men if ever there were, rode in, braving epithets from the mob, and marched up to the city hall, where they presented Farragut's terms to the mayor. These included a formal declaration of surrender as well as the order to replace the Confederate flag with the stars and stripes atop all public buildings. But the mayor, presumably speaking for his people, rebuffed them. As to a document of surrender, he told the two federal officers, This satisfaction you cannot obtain at your, our hands. He went on to say in his reply to Farragut that this city is without the means of defense against the overpowering armament before it, and therefore to acknowledge a formal surrender would be an idle and unmeaning ceremony. So far as replacing the Confederate flag was concerned, the mayor rose on his highest political horse, declaring, I could not find in my entire constitution so wretched and desperate a renegade as would dare to profane the sacred emblem of our aspirations. I think that merely occupying New Orleans does not transfer allegiance from the government of the citizens to which to one which they have deliberately repudiated. Farragut joined us in this news with equanimity. To him, Merely having possession of the largest and most commercially important city in the Confederacy was satisfaction enough. Next day, a Sunday, he ordered that services be conducted on the open decks on each of his ships, hoping it might help defend 
diffuse some of the hostility. If that were so, Joshua lived. For any day now, General Butler and his 10,000 Yankees would arrive in New Orleans to take over. As this event transpired, Commodore Foote was still stewing above Memphis, while his ships slobbed his shells into Fort Pillow. He was elated by the news of the fall of New Orleans, but his physical condition from the wound at Fort Donaldson had only grown worse. Finally, he has to be replaced. When Washington granted the request by placing in charge Commodore Charles Henry Davis, a 50-year-old Boston Brahmin who, until now, had been strictly a saltwater sailor. Davis had no better idea than Foot did about how to get a Fort Pillow, except to wait for the return of the Federal Infantry to storm the position. Meantime, the best he could do was continue Foot's practice of stationing a mortar boat a mile or two down river to toss shells into the fortification at half-hour intervals. That, that vessel was guarded by one of the large ironclads, which rotated the duty with the other six that waited about three miles above at a spot in the river known as Plum Point Bend. This week it happened to be the Cincinnati's turn, when on May 10th the unexpected again became the reality. At the same time that Foote was preparing remarks for his departure ceremony, a council of war was held was being held at Memphis among the capital among the captains of the Confederate River Defense Fleet. It had been sent up from New Orleans a month earlier before it was apparent that the real danger to the city lay not from foot but from Farragut below. Now that this bitter fact had been revealed itself, the question weighing heavily on the current on the mind of Captain James E. Montgomery, the rebel commander, was what to do next. None of the options were as pretty. Sixty miles to the north, gathered near Fort Pillow, sat the enemy, seven huge ironclads as well as the mortar boats, and various tenders and support vessels, all fresh off their victories at Fort Henry and Donaldson, and Island Number 10. To the south was Farragut's armada of ocean-going steam warships, working its way north after conquering New Orleans. If Vicksburg fell, or if Farragut's fleet somehow got past it, the eight scantily clad and armed Confederate rams would likely find themselves in the un- enviable position of having to fight both enemy fleets at once, with predictable results. The one thing Montgomery and his rebel skippers had in their favor was surprise. If first now Davis's fleet began steaming south, rebel scouts of Fort Pillow and along the river would be able to sound, would be able to sound the warning, while well, the Yankees enjoyed no such intelligence system along the river banks. Foot was taken and the decision was, quite literally, to sink or swim. At 7 a.m. on May 10th, a Union sailor who had been wholly stoning decks aboard Cincinnati began hollering that there were eight rebel steamboats coming around the bend, bearing straight down on them from a mile away. Clearly, Montgomery had achieved a surprise. Cincinnati was broke to trees alongside the riverbank, while most of her crew enjoyed a leisurely Saturday morning, drinking coffee, washing clothes, and preparing for inspection. Her steam was so far down she hadn't the power to hold herself in the current, or even turn her wheel when the alarm was first sounded. Gun crews rushed to their stations as general quarters was called up was called, but with the exception of the engineers down below who were throwing oil and everything less burnable into her fires, the men aboard Cincinnati could only wait and watch with dismay as the rebel steamers bore in on them at full speed. Great plumes of black smoke billowing from their stacks and pushing ten foot tall waves were blown or bones in their teeth, at the bows. These were the so-called cunning clad, though each was also protected by whatever scrap iron and tin their skippers had managed to scrounge. The general's fleet, some called it, as most of the boats were named after southern generals. Leading the pack was the General Bragg, described by one participant as a powerful golf steamer, built full in the bow and standing out 20 feet above the surface of the river. When the rebel ram was scarcely 50 yards off, Cincinnati loosed a blast from her starboard battery that sent cannon bells and splinters flying into the air, but on Bragg came until she struck at Cincinnati's a glancing blow, which her cast iron prow that produced a fearful crash, tearing a hole twelve feet long and six feet deep in the Union ironclad, flooding her magazine and knocking down everything from one end of the boat to the other. This was indeed a mighty collision, but unfortunately for the Bragg, she was left with her iron beak stuck securely in Cincinnati's topside, whereupon the Federal gun b- gunners unleashed another broadside that blew Bragg out and away, out and away, and tore in a mental on her from side to side. 
according to an Ohio's newspaper reporter who claimed to have been aboard the Union ship. The relation of the Yankee gun crew was palpable but momentary, owing to the sudden appearance of the Sumter, which, under a full head of steam, then struck Cincinnati in the fantail, cutting it to her three feet, destroying her rudders and steering apparatus, and letting the water pour into the hull of the boat. Next in line came the General Lovell, which smashed into the Cincinnati's port quarter, and hold there too. That settled it, and more ways than one, as Cincinnati began to sink to the bottom, which fortunately for her was only wheelhouse deep, her survivors scrambled up to the top deck, only to be met by a hail of bullets from Sum- Sumter's rebel sharpshooters, who brought down a considerable number of them, including the captains who were shot in the mouth. Meantime, racket from the battle had been rumbled back upriver, and while the Yankee fleet scrambled to get into action, it, too, was caught with the steam down and came into the battle to destroy Nibby, with Mount City well ahead of the pack. As soon as she rounded the bend, Mount City found herself face to face with a general Van Dorn, which plowed to her almost head on, forcing her to make for the bank, where she sank ingloriously stern first into the Mississippi mud. Next to her arrived was the USS Benton, which came into the fray like a bear beset by hornets. Sailors strained it on the sunk. Yankee ships gawked at the spectacle through the thickening gun smoke like so many turkeys on a corn crib, while Benton's pilot put her helm so hard over that she began spinning around in midstream like a revolving door, blasting alternately with her forward side and stern batteries of nine-inch Dahlgrens at the fierce little Confederate rams. As other ships of the Yankee fleet began to appear, Montgomery decided that enough good work had been done for one day and hoisted the signal to retire beneath the guns of Fort Pillow. Davis was relieved to let them go, unmolested, while he contemplated the significance of the morning's events. With two of the most powerful ships sitting in on the bottom, it was clearly a defeat for the Union Navy. Commodore Davis was still trying to adjust to the import of the bold rebel attack when a few days afterward, he was bewildered by another surprise. One afternoon, while his fleet lay at anchor off Plum Point, six peculiar-looking vessels of war, flying the stars and stripes, appeared from upriver, steamed past his ships, and anchored off to themselves, without so much as a hello. Confederate scouts alongside the river banks had seen the boats earlier, but thought they were some kind of transports. When a gig was sent over to investigate, Davis was even more perplexed to learn that this little flotilla was commanded by Faulty an army lieutenant colonel named Alfred Ellis. Presently, the officer in charge of this new force arrived with three more of the strange craft and introduced himself to Davis as Colonel Charles Ellis, brother of Lieutenant Colonel Alfred Ellis, and carrying papers from the War Department signed by Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, authorizing him to conduct naval operations against the enemy with the concurrence of the senior naval officer present. Here was a weird animal indeed, a navy run by the army. And not only that, but apparently by an army of elites as well, six of them in all, cousins, brothers, nephews, etc., who commanded most of the boats. These, of course, were the elusive elite rams, earlier alluded to, the concept for which had initially been rejected by both the army and the navy, before finally being taken on as an army project, supervised by its creator, Colonel Charles Elliot, with the express blessing of Stanton himself. The crews were a hodgepodge of volunteers from infantry regiments and civilian river boat men who not only received the going rate for seamen's wages, which was much higher than the equivalent military pay, but also were in line for bonuses akin to the old custom of prize money for each rebel craft sunk or captured. Ellis' initial meeting with Davis did not go well. The Commodore was vaguely aware that some plan for adding rams to his fleet was in the works, but he had not understood the nature of their relationship. Now, however, he was confronted by an audacious army colonel who wanted the Navy's cooperation for an immediate joint attack on the Confederate fleet at Fort Pillow or Memphis or wherever they were. Davis, who had just tangled with this bunch, insisted it was impract- impractical, not only because it would bring the Union warships under the guns of Fort Pillow, but, as Foot had argued earlier in Island No. 10, should any of his valuable ironclads be damaged, they might be swept downriver into the hands of the enemy.
since I was charged from the War Department, had been to secure the concurrence of the senior naval officer on hand, he asked Davis if it would be all right for his rams to give it a try. Though Davis considered such a mission suicidal and privately confided that the rams were not much, were not worth much, the Commodore agreed, oddly to concur but not to cooperate. And with that, Ellet departed to make his preparations for engaging the Confederate Navy. His task was not without its trials. First, in addition to the regular scuttlebutt about dangers from the fort and the rebel gunboats, the river men also got wind that the Confederates were hard at work building two large ironclads of their own in Memphis. This was true enough so far as it went. Work was indeed being pushed forward at the Memphis docks on the Arkansas and the Tennessee, a pair of 165-foot behemoths armed with columbans, dogrins, and long-range six-inch rifles, but they were far from completed. Nevertheless, some of Ellis' jittery civilian cruisemen asked for their pay in the party, causing temporary delays. After reshuffling his personnel to suit these developments, Ellis prepared his attack for June 5th, but, as a precaution, sent his brother Alfred ahead the night before in a light yaw to reconnoitre the fort and its environs. After drawing near to Polo in the early morning hours, Alfred noticed no, visibly, no visible activity and, on closer inspection, found to his astonishment that it had been abandoned. Accordingly, he had his men rule over to the shore and land, while he personally planted the national colors upon the ruins of one of the magazines, and sat down to await the coming of daylight in the ramps. The situation was likewise at Fort Randolph, a much smaller Confederate installation some 25 miles farther south which was also found deserted. But now the whole federal fleet had been alerted, and Davis got up steam on his ironclads, following Ellet and his rams down the winding river course toward Memphis, another grand prize in the winning of the West.